Um, but it's my great pleasure to um, introduce the next session. Um, and it's it's wonderful to have um, some some new faces or new faces that Eventful um, have not worked with before. Um, that's Pierre and Jacques from Spatial Edge, the co-founders. And um, I must tell you guys that your your business's name has been pronounced in various ways amongst my team members. Um, and I hope I've got it right. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for, for being with us. Um, again, you look very slick and we are looking forward to hearing more about your business and more about what you do. Um, and I won't steal your thunder by, by divulging too much of that. So over to you guys. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. So just yeah, before we get started, my name is Pierre Leroux. I am the CMO, one of the co-founders, and this is Jacques, uh, Dr. Jacques Detoy. He's our CTO um, and also one of, our, one of the co-founders. So, yeah, just before we get started diving into the three common mistakes that our teams make and essentially how to avoid them or fix them, depending on where you are in uh, your data maturity, um, we at Spatial Edge, we do um, data science machine learning. We help big organizations with building out the capabilities and empowering data science teams. Um, there's a lot more to it. If you guys are interested in everything that we have to do, you can go check out the video in the booth or come and have a chat with us afterwards in the live booth uh, or just send us an email or check out our website, uh, which is spatialedge.co.za. But yeah, cool. Without further ado, let's chat about the three common mistakes that data teams make. Cool. So the... First and foremost mistake uh, is what we've seen in the industry is what we call misspent effort. Now, this it can be interpreted in many different ways, but essentially the first thing is that we've seen that data scientists sometimes do everything. Now, I mean, it's quite interesting because uh, it, I think it kind of depends on the maturity of the business. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen mm -hmm. is when you get started, you kind of have a small team that just consists of data scientists and you haven't really thought about some of the other roles in the organization. So they end up doing everything mm -hmm. from data ingestion, uh, uh, transformations to deployments. Yeah. Yeah, I think also one of the things as well is essentially people have to prove value usually for these kinds of new endeavors in their organization. So they would start off with a small team and usually that team does pick up far more of that data life cycle, right, than, uh, than you would ordinarily in a more more mature organization and that does usually start with data scientists doing everything but uh, they're not always well suited uh to all of those different uh bits of that pipe there we go and then and then obviously as your as your maturity progresses and as you start deploying more of these machine learning models to production you start uh needing more and more various roles mm -hmm. now the 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 general way to kind of avoid this or improve upon this is then to actually start hiring some of the other roles that that existed for example your data engineers uh your, your data analysts your machine learning engineers uh software or integration engineers your product owners because at the end of the day it, it, i guess it is a team sport yeah yeah no definitely i think the the uh, uh, once you've essentially got some of these these sort of use cases producing some sort of value then it makes sense to to expand those teams but um you know the 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 thing is that ultimately, you know, the, the data scientists who are doing some of that initial prototyping, that initial uh, cornering of the value, proving the business case, are not always going to be the ones who are best at rolling out infrastructure, right, <clears throat> or supporting data infrastructure, yes. uh, architecting their data in a way that even makes reasonable sense. Um, so, you know, those sorts of uh, things become uh, problematic early on. And then with these other roles that you can essentially augment the team with, you can get a much more uh, structured flow through that entire uh, product sort of uh, life cycle. This actually quite touches quite nicely on, I guess, the data science of the end-to-end -end analytics life cycle, which you just mentioned, which is basically yeah, taking the data from from the raw source through data engineering. Yeah. So then yeah. your data scientists can start actually focusing on what they need to focus, and you've got these different roles, and you can and they can form in different ways. I think we've seen them form uh, where you've got areas of competency. I yeah. think you might have mentioned that yeah. now as well, uh, yeah. or sometimes use case driven. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but I mean, it's, I suppose you know some of the older roles that are more established, are, um, you know, more you know, the data analyst is quite a commonly understood role. Uh, you know, people composing dashboards, getting results from those dashboards. You know, that's that stuff that's been around for a long time. People 
people are quite uh, familiar with that. The issue that you now have is that you've got a couple of these new sort of stages that have emerged, right? Some of this predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, you know, these things are a little bit more uh, 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 tricky to implement and not so well understood. So, you know, where do they fit in? But we're getting, you know, people have been getting there now for the last few years. So it's, uh, it, it's nicely structured now. But essentially, those you know those roles have properly emerged, yes. and they need support around them essentially to get some of those derived insights right into the yes. into the end user's hands. It's not uh, it's not always so simple to explain why something has gone ahead and suggested this course of action. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of stuff around it that still has to operate. Um, you know, and the thing is though, when these teams start up, it's usually like, oh no, it's fine. We got we've got a handful of data scientists. We're good to go. Uh, but, you know, it's not so simple uh, as you scale, uh, especially. Cool. Yeah, so, so that's the first part of misspent effort. The second part of, that also tends to happen is the, <laughs> this is a, a little bit of the first, you know, we start out, we spend three years building out this whole data lake. Now, it's not necessarily just a, a data lakes, but it could be anything. First, we need to kind of spend a lot of effort and time designing um, uh, uh, having conversations about figuring out exactly what the best vendor is. And then finally, after all that deliberation, I mean, six, seven months down the line, uh, you know, you, hopefully uh, they, they end up making a decision. But uh, uh, what we've seen generally in, in this case, obviously works better, is start with a, starting with a single use case. Yeah. But actually, it's funny because there's the, you know, there's, those, there's, the, there's the buy it sort of mentality and then there's the build it mentality. And then yes. you sort of want sort of some path in the middle there. Uh, but we have seen this. We've seen it across a few industries, right, where uh, verticals, right, where people decide, okay, we've got to do this big build. We're going to invest. We're going to get that foundational data infrastructure in place, you know, with uh, some of these newer technologies or whatever else it may be. And then from then on, we'll go ahead and try and realize some of the value from those, those data assets. But the problem at that point is you've lost a lot of opportunities to prototype, to prove value. So there's essentially money on the table that you've left behind there. And at the end of it, you haven't managed to connect, you know, from source to sync. You haven't really exercised that entire uh, uh, information flow. So entire some of the integrations on. later on become problematic uh, at the expense of delivering the actual insights, right, which was the point initially. And I mean, this is maybe where it's probably worthwhile to just say there's a little bit of a kind of a difference here, right? Because on the one hand, we have that descriptive dashboard approach, which is quite commonplace. And in yes. this case, you know, this is now... People trying to apply, you know, I guess what uh, machine learning and uh, mathematical optimization to these sorts of problems, right? So, so it is a little bit, a little bit different. You know, you kind of want to start to exercise that part of the of the process instead of halting the whole thing, because an in, something that you discover when the product makes a recommendation drives you back into the lake, and then you say, oh, what's going on with the data over here? Uh, and that happens time and time again, right? You know, working with the data leads to discovering something about the source system that's not correct or the way the data is captured that's not correct. And speaking of roles, which is not really the responsibility of the data scientist, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway. But actually, you, you touched on a few things there. And I think the one the one main thing was also having that end-to-end -end flow, yeah. having that early on uh, and it, almost building, uh, I guess, following a, a, a lean approach of building some of that capabilities out for that specific use case to solve that specific problem. So you can touch the... I guess it's also another nice analogy where it's, you can go wide. You mm. first build your whole data lake. You first do all the ingestions, and and, and then kind of you build up the stack. Yeah, you or sort you of can, stack it up. Yeah, or, or you can go vertical, and then mm. you say, look, let's focus on this this thing here, and let's do let's get the data assets mm. that are, are mm. important for this specific yeah. use case first. Um, sure, the the first time, first few times you do this, it it might be a lot more, um, uh, what do we call it, manual, or you might not have. All this all the capabilities in place but you have you, the idea is to obviously build that good enough and as you iterate and add more data sources as you build out your data lake you already have use cases in production yeah and then you're improving those and, and exercising yeah. that pipeline over and over again like, one of the analogies i love you actually use at, at many of our clients is kind of widening that pipe yeah yeah you sort of start with a stream a small trickle and then that thing widens into a stream and into a river essentially yeah. but i think that's what's nice about the data lake style technologies, right? You can, can essentially ingest all these data there, land them, and start to work on them before, you know, before the entire, uh, you know, all those assets are there. 100%. Um, I think 
it's probably just because a lot of the enterprise data warehouses and things have this other approach where they were always there when people started. So oh, they you really know, had, with, with lakes, we don't have to work like that. You can, you know, you can start quite early on and at least get some of those things flowing through. Of course, there's a bigger technical discussion around architecting it correctly so that you don't end up uh, in the wrong place. Yes. But that doesn't have to prevent you from, from realizing first, value early. First, first building those few vertical yeah. use cases. Cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's just the second one on misspent effort. And then there's another one here, which is uh, developing highly accurate, you know, great data products, but sometimes focusing on the wrong use cases. Oh, there's a tricky one. <laughs> so so what, what do I mean with this? This is like, uh, there's so in the data science world or in the, this data space, there are lots and lots of different use cases that you can attack, especially, uh, I mean, it, it depends also on, on your organization, but there's lots of opportunities to make more money. There's lots of opportunities to save uh, uh, money inside of the organization themselves. But then what tends to happen is data scientists or data engineers, I, I don't want to actually just take a dig at data scientists. Sorry, it actually feels like we're taking a bit of a dig at them, but essentially in data teams, they love, I mean, as creators, they, lo they love building um, uh, these models. That's what they actually kind of set out to do, right? So they love building these models. They love focusing on these things. And they could sometimes pick up specific use cases that does not have that much business value attached to it. Mm -hmm. Maybe build mm -hmm. that out for the next 12 months only to realize later on, hey, this might have been a mistake. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, can you not realize the mistake earlier on? Um, mm -hmm. you know, before you go on that whole journey yeah. of, of building it out. Yeah, so I mean, you know, this this is a tricky one because organizations have strategic objectives, right? Which is sometimes oh, yes, driven 100%. from higher up. So a lot of these teams will be uh, approaching or trying to solve those strategically valuable problems, which sometimes are a little bit more intractable, but, you know, uh, they, 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 they're, they're getting direction, I suppose, from external to probably that kind of that group. So there's not a business, silly business case or it's such a, an easy value case, but it is value mm, in it yeah. certain, from a strategic yeah. perspective to the organization. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I mean, and there, there, there's good, you know, there's good data out there on this sort of thing. Like a lot of these uh, large firms have gone and done a bunch of research there. And it's most of, most of uh, enterprises are using this kind of analytics at the moment and big data and that sort of thing for operational efficiency, right? So yes. how do we take existing processes and make those better? You know, that's kind of where, where everybody is. And there's a lot of these strategic goals that drive that sort of thing. You know, we've got, we're incurring this cost in this area. Let's try to reduce that sort of cost. So the teams don't always get to choose. Um, I think maybe what you're talking about here as well is maybe when they do get to choose uh, more, right? Yes. And I mean, when, when, when they do get to choose, that's where the trick comes in because not everybody has that sort of business mindset. Uh, in the on the on the data analyst side, um, and there a lot of organizations have worked out some cool tricks to to sort of help them out. Like I actually saw one with a, a cool online store in the Netherlands. Uh, I attended one of their talks, and they had a really great way of ideating uh, potential use cases in this sprint structure. So they would work for two weeks. They would have an initial uh, business problem objective stated, and then the the teams would set off. In a, in a large group and try and get to some sort of simple first order solution to that problem. Just and at the end of the two weeks, they would look at it and say, is this feasible? Um, and report on those results. And then if, it, if, if, there was, if they could make the value obvious and the implementation had some clear path right, to, to, to the answer, then they would make it a real project. And then they would attack it. And then again, after a certain amount of time, they would check in. And so they're constantly trying to eliminate the project based on what they're observing about it instead of kind of getting that sunk cost mentality. Oh, my goodness, we've been working on this for so long. Yes. Uh, we can't stop. So, um, yeah, so people are, people are definitely that, approaching. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful approach. Actually. Yeah, it's great. I'd love to that, see it. So, so, the, so the, the other things I want to mention about that as well is um, uh, there's also that thing of obviously you want, you're solving a business case and a business problem. I mean, they're kind of eliminating yeah. all these potential options. So once you've, for example, have that business case or business problem, uh, my recommendation is generally, you know, internally as a data team, go talk to the people you are serving, yeah. uh, uh, create, a, like, create a little bit of a business case uh, around it and improve the value of the business case, which is essentially what they were doing, but they were just doing it on mass, sprint by sprint, focusing on, yes, all the potential ones, let's execute and cut them off. Uh, and then obviously go with the one that works. Mm. And I mean, that, that's also obviously a lot easier to get budget once you've got a proven a really good business value case. And mm. you can do that. You don't have to build out the whole model. 
um, deploy everything, all the capabilities. You don't need yeah. all of that. You can start yeah. with basic proof of concepts, basic proof of value. Yeah, so I mean, I'm getting a bit of a smile on my face because it's one of my sort of uh, little mild passions here. But essentially, this is an empirical effort, right? Yes. You know, uh, data science and you know a lot of these analytical tasks that we do are empirical. So you sort of have a basic hypothesis you set out to try to answer it or disprove it, and then uh, you get something rudimentary working. And then uh, you look at the rudimentary thing and say, well, can I do additional work to improve it, right? I've got these measurements now, let me try to improve it. So you can sort of iteratively and empirically drive towards better outcomes. Yes. And all along that path, you engage with the stakeholders and you take them on that journey and that, that, that works. That actually leads me into the next one. Um, Maybe I'm skipping a slide, sorry. No, it's perfect. <laughs> actually, mess a little bit out. I think the, the slides here are... Ah, sorry. So, so next one's about few internal capabilities. And this now, uh, uh, when, when you're talking about measurements and being empirical, uh, we've got, uh, yeah, it's like no or little automation, especially in the beginning, no or little CICD, no or little measurements, no or little version control, and, well, it's, it's what we call laptop or notebook data science. Now, don't get me wrong. Obviously, there is a place for... Um, doing notebook data science and figuring out, developing the model, uh, experimenting with it. Yes. It's, it's like a little bit of, like almost a laboratory setting. But then once you've done that, you've kind of, you've got something that is accurately working and you're happy with the results. Mm. Now into transition to a place where it starts delivering value to the business yeah. in, in that production environment. Look, I'm also passionate about notebook data science, right? But <laughs> um, I think the laptop on there is important because, I mean, nowadays, essentially, so much of the data that people are working on, you know, is housed uh, in pay-as-you-go cloud-style services or, or whatever else. So there is an integration cost later if you have a really great idea, which sucks on the technical side. But, um, you know, I think, I think this is also one of those tricky things where, uh, in particular, I'm, if you focus on the no or little version control, you know, there's, there's such great tools in data teams now for people to sort of leave behind a trail of evidence, right, in the work that they're doing. And, you know, that's important on these higher order analytical tasks like prediction and, and prescriptive work because, you know, people are chasing a sort of a, a, an unknown very often. And then they might be a few steps ahead and realize, oh, hang on, I need to go back to where I was working before. And it sounds trivial, but people struggle with that in these large teams where they have deadlines. So, um, there are a few tools that try to assist people uh, there, technologies that try to assist the teams there. But, you know, there's just some really simple process things that people can also do. Um, and, I mean, that's, it, that's, that's critical, really. I mean, having some sort of uh, versioning approach is critical to the work. Uh, so, so you're just saying it's not necessarily just the tools, but just the way your team approaches it, the yeah. way your team structures the data, the way yeah. your team ad addresses experiments. I mean, tooling can make your life a lot easier. Obviously, there is, like you said, great tooling, but it's then also about, okay, how do we as a team now um, uh, mm. figure out? But, yes. but, but, but so, so actually so, also, does, mm. I think that will touch on better reproducibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think something that's not, yeah, so that's maybe something that uh, we can talk a bit more. I mean, that's a process thing in general as well, right? So sure, there's tools, but people can devise these approaches or at least implement these approaches to, uh, to getting, making sure that they at least are verifying the outcomes in their teams before taking it to the end user and so on, you know? So there's a lot of really handy things that people can do early on on the capability side. It's not just all about tooling and all about some new, new, new product that you've purchased, but about things like buddy systems and, you know, reviewing, reviewing your teammates' work, having some sort of funnel of, of, uh, of QA really through that sort of, yes. through that data product, right? Until you get to the until you get to the customer, and I mean that sort of thing can happen without a lot of this tooling. But when you start to do that more regularly, and you've got a few of these models that are delivering value, then things like your, you know, your automation, your CI/CD, and that sort of thing becomes pretty critical because you know you can't have the data side teams are going to be stuck. They're yeah. going to be busy yeah. all the time, yeah. just fixing things, maintaining yeah. things without. Yeah. yeah, and I mean that's where the roles and responsibilities come in, right? The data scientists are there in the business of trying to sort of solve these these business problems and get those insights out, right? They're not there to worry about when you need to automatically restart a pipeline because you know something's gone wrong in the data. Cool. I think we quickly just need to move on. I think we're running a little bit out of time. Got th sorry. This is just a little. Uh, a fun image from MLOps that I wanted to put in here as well. It's the MLOps website. I think by uh, the maintaining it, in our IQ is maintaining it. It's actually just a very nice uh, view of, for example, building out these kinds of environments. 
I do recommend you guys go look at uh, that website as well if you want to learn more about it. We, we obviously help organizations to implement these things. But now I want to I want to get kind of just get on to the last one for the uh, uh, last few minutes that we have available. Um, so for this specific one, uh, it, it, it might be a little bit counterintuitive, not something you, you generally hear everywhere, but the point of the data, of building out models or data assets or data products is you're building it out for a specific customer, be that external customer, be it an internal customer, employee, other employees inside the organization. You know, you're building it for someone to solve some problem or to generate more revenue for, for the business. Now, you, you can obviously gather a lot of information up front, um, talk to the customers in the beginning, which I mean, 100% that's what you should do. And then what I tend to happen, they, they kind of forget about them. Uh, over time and then you know six months seven months eight months go by and suddenly you've got the solution you've built this data asset this data product or maybe even three months go by and you built, you've, you, you've you've got the sync now you deliver it um and now suddenly they're like oh hold on one this is not exactly what i was looking for two okay but how does mm. this work this is a little bit like magic mm. it's a black box for me uh, i don't understand how this thing works so i'm not going to trust it so if you see, run into all these kinds of issues um, if you forget about your customer. Mm. Yeah, so I mean there, yeah, uh, definitely. I think the, and the challenge there as well is that uh, I think usually in large enterprises, in any case, people are quite comfortable, you know, relinquishing some of that control to like the subject matter experts. I mean, that's quite commonplace, but having that check-in quite regularly with them leads to way better outcomes, obviously, right? Because 100%. it's not, it's, it, it's one thing having the initial scoping and the idea, and this is the problem we're going to solve and everyone gets together and they talk about it and everyone's invigorated and excited. And then, you know, they go off and there's not really much communication again for, for some time, but ha taking people along that journey, particularly those stakeholders means that they interrogate the results, even as raw as they may be along that, along that development of that product and their insights are, pretty much most of the time super valuable right because they're subject matter experts yeah and i mean it's a, it's a little question that they might ask that drives uh, the 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 result into in, into a better direction and the last thing you're talking about that acceptance of the results or or you know the comfort in this rather strange complex solution giving them giving them decisions and direction comes from them seeing its development right uh, so taking them along that journey makes the uat the you know the user acceptance at the end yes much simpler and easier to achieve otherwise you know you've got people who are trying to relinquish what they are typically doing gut feel decisions and people some people put quite a lot of um uh, stock in 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 their in their well, gut feel well, well, so, most most have been at in the business for yeah, 20 years 25 exactly. years now now you're coming with a new tool a new model for them to learn and they're like okay but you know i kind of i like the old way of doing it so obviously bringing them mm. on board, yeah. taking them through the journey is quite yeah. is amazing. I just want to, there's something that actually is quite interesting and that's also, why do people not want to do it? And and what I've seen, I mean, you can expand this if you wish, but what, what I've seen there is, um, it's very difficult if you're building something to when it's not ready yet, you know, it's like there's a few bugs here, this thing's not, 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 not really working. So like uh, uh, to then now expose yourself and show this to people, but that's exactly the, the right time to start doing it and getting some of the feedback, testing some of your assumptions. Yeah. Because then you can still make make changes. Yeah. You're not that bored into it. Yeah. Just yet. Yeah, agreed. And then and then the last thing on this also is the internal champions. So so it's it's, it's a word we we, we use out of, uh, 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 in our organization where you're building up these internal champions, creating them. What that allows you to do then is. Obviously, they get sucked in. They get an understanding of what you're building. They have a lot of empathy with you as, you as you're going through the process. And then they start advocating inside the organization for your solution. They start sharing it with their other colleagues. Um, it, essentially, that kind of, I want to say noise or, or, or um, uh, it's almost like an internal word, word of mouth in the organization. Mm. Then starts spreading. People start hearing about, oh, this amazing solution they got from the data team. And now other people want to start buying into that. Other people also have problems that they'd like to get solved. So now you're starting to create this pull effect where uh, other internal teams are coming to you, asking you for solutions, wanting to go on the same journey, solving their problems. They also want to want to take part. Um, and this obviously, again, I mean, but you, most most teams do work with budget constraints, but now it becomes obvious. You've delivered this value to these people. Um, they will actually go out and get budget for you. We've actually had a few examples like that where the internal champions were like, we really loved um, what you guys built here. We actually would like to get more mm. budget so we can do more of this, uh, improve on this, mm. uh, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, because I, you know, I think the, the the kinds of problems that get solved do take time to resolve. You know, the organizations that, that aim to do this in maybe three months or maybe six months, they'll have a prototype done, and invariably it does take quite quite long to get that done. So there's a lot of opportunities to cultivate these sorts of relationships, 100%. and I think then as well, you know, these the, these participants, the subject matter experts, they've contributed to that result, so they yes. become invested in it. Yes, Go so creation. it's quite natural, I think, for them to to become promoters of of the solution. Of course, the solution must work. If it doesn't work, then <laughs> then uh, yes, it must actually yeah. deliver some results, yes. right? Yes. At the end of the day, <laughs> um, that actually reminds me about the um, that's the Kia effect, right? Where uh, it, when you're taking part of the process, it, it yeah. becomes yours as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of value in not forgetting about your customer and taking them with you on the journey. So this this is our three different mistakes. I do have a few bonus ones if there is time left, the time available. Oh, maybe it's actually one thing I actually want to mention on the forgetting about your customers. A good way to do it is if you are running, running sprint structure, uh, scrum structure, uh, sprints every two weeks, obviously uh, the sprint review is like the ideal opportunity to share, but then also in between getting some feedback from them. Um, so if you guys have any questions at this point in time, I don't think that I haven't seen any questions come through, but you can. No. Oh, yeah. How are you? Oh, wait, no, that's not, I think, our session. But if you guys do have any questions, ooh, here's an interesting question from 949. Okay. What would you say are the top three things that create value proposition for data science and, and will help an organization attract and retain talent? <laughs> That's, oh, uh, I see Andreas coming on. I think our time is running out. Oh, uh, 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 you are muted. Oh, it's fine. Okay. Okay. So let's quickly answer the question. Great. Uh, top three things to create value proposition for data science and will help an organization attract and retain talent. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that last that last line is quite tricky because I think that's anyway where a lot of organizations define themselves now. It's a yeah. highly competitive space. We're seeing that yeah. for some of our customers. Um, yeah. I think I think one of the things that really works for us actually where we tend to get involved is you know by by improving the process and getting kind of distributing some of that responsibility within teams so maybe i'm going yeah. into a little bit of detail here but um what we found when we arrive at organizations is that sometimes data scientists are almost solely responsible for the delivery Obviously. of some data to an end user um and it's sure they're in a team uh, you know and they're all working together but uh in the end it's really comes down to maybe just one or two people so we tend to try to uh, create sort of structures within these teams where people are more collectively responsible. It's a lot of, it is a lot of uh, 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 responsibility to, to be the person on the hook for data that goes out and gets actioned. And then, uh, you know, they, uh, the, the user might come back and say, well, hang on, what's, what's going on here? So we tend to, we tend to try to de-risk things for the team members a little bit. Yeah. And that actually makes them a lot more innovative and productive. Yes. And it also takes some of that, pressure off um you know it's uh and, and actually in the same breath while mm -hmm. while taking the pressure people sh shared in the team i also want to say that just running proper sprints and having sprint reviews and kind of having them own and and be excited about the work that they're doing uh, uh and, and seeing the value it is creating working with uh, almost dealing with those customers internal customers uh, in those sprint reviews um mm -hmm. motivates a lot of people to do more stay involved and I think that will definitely help with retaining some of the talents. So I must say that just, Maritza, the, uh, the top three things. So it's quite interesting. Data scientists is such a diverse crowd at the moment. I mean, I think I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm trained originally in this area and worked in this area for a while. And we all have different things, I think, that appeal to us. So, you know, it's quite tricky. Um, you know, some people want to work with the biggest data possible. You know, other people are very interested in solving the business problems themselves. Uh, we actually got couple of people who are quite theoretical and excited by the application side of things. So it's really, it's really quite tricky. I think it usually the culture is the thing that gets people hooked. Yeah. And then yeah. the way the teams operate is what gets them to stay. Uh, that's yeah, definitely yeah. what we've seen. So, I mean, I think we're out of time. So I'm just going to quickly close or say, we'll answer the other questions, I guess, in the chat. You can also come and chat to us in the live booth. Uh, if you guys are interested, we'll, we'll, we'll stay on a little bit longer. Cool. Oh, thanks, thanks guys. I see. Thank I see that we Esther also asked a question um, yes. that she would like you guys to answer. And I think maybe we can quickly ask that. You said um, 
Um, yes. The idea of using cases approach was intriguing because, oh, I see there's quite a few, a few questions also still popping up. So you guys um, are welcome yeah. to answer um, those questions now because we've got a tea break. So, um, or you can move over to your booth area and answer them there. So I'm happy for you to continue here okay. in the space. I know there's quite a lot of people, but Piers, would you like me to read the questions? Or can you guys um, see them? I don't know. Oh, that's fine. We, I think we can, you can we see can them, see yeah. Them. Okay, cool. So, so okay, perfect. So, if there's a tea time for the next fifteen minutes, whoever wants to stay on, we'll we'll basically spend the next fifteen minutes yeah. answering questions. Yeah, yeah. Happy there. with that. Happy with that. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah, Enjoy. So, so, thanks. So, Esther asked, the ideating use case approach is intriguing. The biggest challenge I found is producing valuable outputs early, as data projects tend to take time. Yes, um, that is uh, true. 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 I think. Yeah, it's it's such a difficult thing to establish in a team culture, actually, right? This idea that, uh, you know, quickly testing and testing something, getting getting feedback as quickly as possible and then making the hard calls. You know, that that is it something I think practice, it I think. takes practice. Yes. And and it, and it does. It's not just about some of the, the data projects as as on, on the whole life cycle. We've actually also seen in some cases there's a dashboard. Right, that's kind of an, an an adjacent byproduct of something that, that you know that's a data a data solution. This adjacent product, and there's this tendency to you know kind of work on this thing and make it really quite perfect, and then go to the customer. And I think that's what we've been talking about in some of yes. the previous sessions there. So we actually uh, sometimes before rolling out maybe even an application to an end user that's also a, a, an adjacent thing to the data product, we actually try to encourage uh, our customers to essentially if it's by hook or by crook if it's mm -hmm. if you've got some simple jpegs or something let's immediately just host it and yes. push it out to the customer yes. and get them to tell us what they think before we invest even anything further in in, in trying to that solution in to further develop that exactly but so what i guess what i'm saying is is that it applies to more than just these long big builds on some of the the data uh, solutions in their entirety but also these little adjacent things, and it's something you have to practice and practice and practice. And I think if you can get it quite organized into your team culture, that it's a good thing to remove uh, solutions sometimes uh, to cull, uh, you know, from your existing solution, then people get quite good at identifying some of that unnecessary work and just chasing to the end. You know, this is what we want to prove. Can we prove it as quickly as possible? Um, we've definitely seen that work, but it takes time. I think I think just to summarize, that's almost like, I mean, if you know what you want to achieve, you've got that end in mind, you've got your hypothesis. You know what the kind of the, just that next step is. Look, I need part of this whole solution is this dashboard. It's got this data set. Okay, cool. Let's mm. quickly draw that, like you just mentioned, uh, in, in a notebook. Take a screenshot of it. There's a few internal champions that we are now dealing with and, and people, internal customers that are very interested in the solution we've been speaking to send it immediately to them, ask them for feedback and mm. push them on that, uh, meet with them, get get that understanding. And then you're like, oh, hold on, they don't like this. This doesn't, not going to work for them. But they start asking you questions where it's like, oh, we, we actually thought, you know, that we, we're going to see these values, we, the, the, the numbers, we want these two values to be together. So it makes that uh, quite, quite nice. Uh, Esther, I'm afraid we, I, I wait, can't. Wait, 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 sorry. sorry, Andrea, you want to say something? No, I, I just wanted to say that, oh, firstly, I'm sorry that uh, my mic disappeared. My computer doesn't enjoy being refreshed. Um, <laughs> but thank you guys so much for your session. I'm going to, to draw it to an end, but okay. it, it's, this, this timing is great because we're actually breaking into a tea break right now. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to end it. But if you have any more questions or you, or you want to chat, and to Pierre and Jacques, you're welcome to go to their booth in the expo area oh, yes. um, now or um, at the end of the day, um, and they would gladly chat to you there. Um, but so for now, we're on a 15-minute tea break until quarter past. Pierre and Jacques, thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting um, and really refreshing format. So thank you so much for that. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed it, and we will see you back in the sessions area um, at quarter past 10. So I'm, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy the um, the questions. So yeah, you guys must just follow us to the booth now. We'll 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 pop on there just now. And then if there's any more questions you guys would like to post, uh, post them in there. I'm just going to quickly copy them so cool. I have them, and then we can go talk further there. Cool. Okay, Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll see you back here at ten past. Perfect.
for your next job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Awesome.